Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. I am speaking today with Don Meikenbaum, who is a psychologist that I have known for, I don't know, Don, we probably many, go many back years. To, to at least, at least 20 years. How was it that we met? I think I attended uh, one of your workshops somewhere. No, no, I, I don't believe that. I impressed. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, I, I mean, how many other speakers do I know take off their shoes and run around? That had immediate appeal. And the other thing that's been fascinating is that over the last three or four evolutions conferences, we've been able to do a sort of Mutt and Jeff show yeah. on, on talking about the state of the art of psychotherapy. So I've enjoyed those. And I think Jeff Zeig even has some of those on tape that people can listen to. Yeah, it, those are always fun, and I feel like you keep me on my toes about what the research says. You're, you're an amazingly active clinician. You've been so for a long time. Uh, Don was voted one of the top 10 psychotherapists of the 20th century, I, and, you know, that, that means there's only 10 other people on the planet that share that distinction. Right, and most of them are dead. <laughs> about to celebrate my 80th birthday and uh, as you know I'm pretty active with regard to what's called the Melissa Institute yes. for Violence Prevention in Miami and and their website is an amazing resource Don yeah yeah and, and your guests are invited to visit this and one of the people we presented at that conference was a guy named Scott Miller hmm. and you can in fact go on and view look at his handout from that presentation. So <laughs> clearly I'm a, I'm a fan of yours and uh, appreciate the invitation here to discuss uh, the origins of cognitive behavior therapy and some of my current efforts. Yeah, and so let's, let's sort of start there because right now, and it might be difficult for some who are just in the field for 10 or even 20 years, cognitive behavioral therapy is the method du jour. It is what's talked about. It's on the list of all evidence-based practices, but that's not where it was when you started this and really were responsible for pulling cognitive and behavioral work together into CBT. Can you tell us yeah. about that development? Yeah, I can. Hang on. Actually, I, I wrote a book called The Evolution of Cognitive Behavior Therapy, okay? And it's published by Rutledge. So actually, quickly, the origin uh, was, there was a time when uh, the field had been preoccupied with just behavioral and had eschewed the, the notions of cognitions and the accompanying emotions as key variables. Mm. And in fact, there was a time when you could not publish articles in JABA and other journals that used the word cognition. And there was, in fact, a um, AABT meeting, and there was a letter circulated within AABT to have all cognitive types kicked out of the association. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I sort of tell the underbelly story. So at this meeting in um, Atlanta, where Terry Wilson and Marv Goldfried, Aaron Beck, Mike Mahoney, and myself met, there was a discussion about whether we should bolt and just create our own cognitive behavioral perspective. The decision was not to do that. I had a newsletter that I had put together that had uh, people who were doing research in the area, and we actually turned that newsletter mailing list into the Journal of Cognitive Behavior Therapy. But one thing that's in the Evolutions book is the true origins of cognitive behavior therapy because uh, I was interviewed and they asked me, like you are, what are the origins of CBT? Yeah. And I could do a very scholarly review going back from Freud to Korbzinski to George Kelly, to Aaron Beck, to Albert Ellis, who sort of took Karen Horney's tyranny of shoulds and made a career out of it and so forth. But let me take this quick opportunity to tell you the true origins. The true origin of cognitive behavior therapy on my mother. Uh, it see, always comes friend, back to mom, doesn't it? It does. It does. So let, let, let me give her due credit. Uh, uh, when my father died, my mother went to work. And, um, and each day she would come home and we would have dinner together. Now, my, my mother was a very interesting, a Jewish mother was a very interesting storyteller. Because not only would she tell what happened to her, she would tell us also what kinds of thoughts and feelings she had 
in that situation. Hmm. And most importantly, she would then do a commentary on which were productive and which were unproductive thoughts and how she inadvertently, unwittingly, and perhaps even unknowingly was making her situation much worse. So I decided to validate my socialization process. So I went to the University of Illinois and I decided, okay, to do a dissertation where I trained schizophrenics to talk to themselves. And what happened was I got a job at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Did that work by and the way? It did actually, we published the article and there've mm. been a number of follow-up studies. Mm. So I went to Ontario and for 40 years, I taught all kinds of people in Ontario to do what my mother does all the time. Mm. So I never understood why I got voted one of the top 10. <laughs> your mother would, your mother should have been That's voted the top 10. So he, he, here's my thought. Could you imagine what the field of psychology would be like if my mother wrote Walden to <laughs> instead of B.F. Skinner. So I'm rethinking all of my therapy, Don, because, you know, uh, I, I, I guess I should have listened to my mother. Well, so I bet that if I saw you in therapy, we could have gotten you to tell us how your mother created the ORS and the SRS. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, one of her and my father's favorite sayings was uh, when I was headed off to school, they would say, do your best and then do a, a bit better. They would say that to you. Mm. And how did that make you feel? You know, no, I won't I, turn this into therapy. I don't okay, that, that's good because I've had enough, you know, some of it effective and some not. But what's the value in knowing the history? We tend to repeat it, okay? And therefore, I think we have an intellectual indebtedness to those people who preceded us. Hmm. The notion that we have new ideas and create new techniques. Look, each of us, including you, are not only homo sapiens, you're a homo nara. You're a storyteller. Hmm. And in fact, all the work we've done, you know, I've, I've just taken this roadmap to resilience book that I have and have made it into a free website that your audience can visit. You know, if they just go to roadmap to resilience.wordpress.com, okay. they will be able to download it. Mm. And in that book, I highlight what distinguishes the 75% of people who are exposed as we are now in the pandemic to various kinds of stresses, loss, deaths, and the like. Even though they're impacted, they go on to evidence resilience, the ability to bounce back, the ability to face ongoing adversities, hmm. versus the 25% who get stuck, who develop PTSD and related associated disorders. Hmm. The notion I have, and it's not new with me, there are many forerunners who have highlighted this constructive narrative perspective that what distinguishes the groups, these two groups, is the nature of the stories that they tell. Hmm. Okay? And not only to themselves, but to others. So if people go to the Melissa Institute website, okay, and download the other part of this on resilience, you will find at least 40 different papers by me. And then look at the variety of ways to bolster resilience in this time of the coronavirus. We are indebted, you know, I, you know, Freud had a lot of stuff on uh, in vivo exposure mm. that Bandura and Foa and others, they talked about self-efficacy well before it was in, in line. And, yeah. and there's one last point I want to make. Yeah. Even though cognitive behavioral is seen as the evidence-based intervention and that we get credit for it, the data is not all that impressive. Mm. It turns out as you adequately highlight that there's no winners to the race. Hmm. So I am a great admirer of your contributions on session by session, feedback informed treatment. Hmm. You know, so your notion of deliberate practice with feedback is something that I embed in all of my training. <laughs> Thanks, so, John. um, by the way, do you have your shoes on now? No, I don't. Okay, I just, I, I, I want to make sure there's some consistency over time. <laughs> so I want to ask you because the, the, there is this historical part. Yeah. And while you are supremely aware of it and you acknowledge it, you are not imprisoned by it. 
because you've been nimble, you've continued to move through the various iterations of this idea of cognition. So that makes me think about how in our field, and this is my perception, maybe I'm completely wrong, we seem to be caught up quite often in ideology and hype, you know, the next and the newest and the greatest thing. So can you say something more about our ideological fixation? It's all in our thoughts. It's all in our behaviors. It's all in our childhood. Right. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm glad you used the word hype. Because hmm. with Scott Lillefeld, we wrote an article last year that was chosen as the most important contribution in the field of psychotherapy. Okay. And in there, we put together a 19-item checklist on how to spot hype in the field of psychotherapy, mm. okay? Mm. The field of psychotherapy is absolutely filled with bullshit, <laughs> okay? You know, it really is. In fact, it gets embarrassing. And there are so many workshops out there. And I'm going, did you not get a PhD? Did you not become a scientist? How could you sit through all this, okay? So what are clinicians to do then, Don? What's the advice? I think that we have identified, as you know, some things that do seem to be key ingredients in leading to behavior changes. And in your work on deliberate practice, you've enumerated a number of these, you know, in terms but you, of- But you have, you have too. So where can people find that information? What are these, what are these evidence-based principles? Okay, well, you know, I, if once again, you can read the articles I've written called The Core Task of Psychotherapy. Core Task and, of Psychotherapy. Right. So the core task of therapy is A, to establish, maintain, and monitor the therapeutic alliance on a session-by-session -session basis. Mm. The second component is how to do collaborative goal setting mm. that nurtures hope, how to have smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Okay? C.R. Snyder and others have highlighted that. Yeah. The next kind of thing is how to do the, use the art of questioning in order to have people engage in discovery-oriented approaches. Um, I am at my therapeutic best when the clients are one step ahead of me, offering the suggestion I would others offer. Mm. Another key element is some clients need some help in developing intra and interpersonal skills. The major problem therein is that it doesn't generalize. This does not lead to lasting changes. Mm. So once again, on the Melissa Institute, I have enumerated what you got to do before, during, and after any training session to increase the likelihood people are going to do it. Mm. Okay? Cool. Not only that, in about 50% of the cases, individuals have a history of victimization. You have to provide the kind of non-judgmental, trusting, secure relationships where people could tell the story at their own time. Mm. You need to help them bolster resilience in, in different domains, physical, mm. interpersonal, emotional, cognitive, behavioral. And here's something interesting, spiritual. Mm. Okay. Mm. So that the major way that people in North America cope with trauma and victimization is to use some form of spirituality. Mm. I gave a five day workshop on how to integrate spirituality and psychotherapy. Mm. That entire handout of 100 pages is online. So I am at what Erickson, Eric Erickson calls the generativity phase of life. Okay? So even <laughs> Wait a minute, wrote, Don. Wait a minute. I, I think you've been there your whole life. So here we are, because all of those things you've mentioned, core tasks, and, and you've provided now a resource everybody can check. But I think I would be remiss if I didn't bring us back to the present moment that we find ourselves in. Okay. And we have 33 million unemployed Americans. They had jobs two months ago. Right. We have a probably approaching 100,000 deaths right. if, in, the United in the United States. And if there are three or four people who know those people, they're affected. And right. if you have their coworkers, then we're talking about millions of people who are close to a death uh, right. as, a, as a result. What is your view about therapists at this particular time? What, what can we do uh, during COVID-19? Uh, you know, a criticism of the handling of this mess, uh, which we could spend hours and hours talking about together. But, right. you know, I've seen therapists, I've been talking with them, they want to be helpful. If, if you have a historical perspective, 
you know, how, how every day there's worse news coming out. Yeah. So the question is, as a society, we survive, whether it's 1918, whether it's the Depression, whether it's World War II, you know, whether it's a certain political decision making. So overall, in terms of the history of mankind, they'll, they'll eventually address this problem. And in a slow, creeping way, fashion, we'll, we'll be able to move forward. We're all stay at home. We're sheltered in place, more or less. So the big issue has to do with telehealth. And how do you implement the core task on a phone call? Hmm. How do you engage the client so that you not only listen to their pain and empathize with it, how do you help them appraise what aspects of their life situation are potentially changeable? and those aspects that are not changeable. And for those features that are changeable, you need to ask and try to assess what skills either individual and the like are in their repertoire. I have a, developed a case conceptualization that looks at risk and protective factors. So you, the therapist, need to be very sensitive to get the rest of the story. So the rest of the story is not only to empathize, which is the most important ingredient from a therapeutic alliance. Hmm. You're trying to ascertain what strengths they've had presently. Who are the social supports? Hmm. The other thing that I think that telehealth therapist should do, as you've noted, is to get the fit ratings at the end of each call. Hmm. Okay. You know, you know, is it okay if I call back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, could, could we have another session like this? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're getting out of this, but I'm getting a hell of a lot out of it. You know, I'm feeling like I'm valued. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach out, mm -hmm. you know. So um, let me give you my FIT score. I mm -hmm. thought this session went really well, Scott. <laughs> I think we've maintained our relationship, okay? Yeah. I think you've provided a good non-judgmental thing. And I look forward to our next Zoom call about how good you made me feel. <laughs> oh, thanks for that, Don. I, do, I want to bring up one other thing I've been hearing from therapists in this telehealth uh, environment, and I'm Please. springing this on you. I've talked about it with colleagues. Clinicians are visual, kinesthetic, auditory beasts, narrative beasts, and now they are limited to this two-dimensional primarily visual and auditory medium. And I'm hearing them say, for example, my colleague, Dr. Jason Seidel, a really talented uh, clinician in Colorado, the Center for Clinical Excellence out there, big, big fit practitioner, has talked about a unique exhaustion, he calls it, hmm. from providing services online. And of course, taking care of ourselves is one part of addressing this, but I wonder if you have any thoughts off the cuff. There's a different kind of exhaustion. At the end of the day, face-to-face -face work, I'm often cognitively depleted, but I feel energized at the same time. I've been in the room with people. I can see the impact. Yeah. You know, it, and it even gets more complicated uh, if you think that the patient who you're talking to or the person you're talking to is so depressed that they may be potentially suicidal. If you go on the Melissa Institute website, we just put David Jobs' article on how to do a collaborative assessment of suicidal potential and management using telehealth. Hmm. So I, you know, I, I think that I'll, I'll get to your question, but I just I think that's a really valuable resource. Sure. Where where he looks at, you know, the challenges that are unique to telehealth. Yeah. Uh, in dealing with it. Mm -hmm. The other kind of tool that you'll see on the roadmap to resilience is how to benefit from historical cultural resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all members of a tribe, you know, and even if we're a minority individuals who are experiencing microaggression, who are more likely to be victimized by the, the coronavirus and so forth, you have to ask, how did, what is it that you inherited? from those who lived before you, hmm. you know, what strengths. The, the last thing to keep in mind, you know, is 
engaging in resilient engendering behavior, whether you're a therapist or the client, you know, uh, engendering uh, positive emotions mm. of gratitude, forgiveness, compassion, a sense of war, being part of nature, um, the degree to which you could find meaning, that's the spiritual, uh, the, the way in which you maintain a moral compass, the degree to which you do what you're doing now, smiling actually has neurological sequelae. Mm. So they've done studies of people who, when they were joining the major leagues, had to make a baseball card. Mm. And those guys who smiled in their rookie card were more likely to make it. There's a study of what you did when you took your high school graduation picture. Those people who were smiling when they took that picture, mm. okay, had more successful careers. Mm. Given your success, I bet you had a shit-eating grin <laughs> on your face at that time. Hey, Don. Thanks so much for sharing your wisdom with us today and the uh, history of the field and CBT. We appreciate all that you uh, do and continue to do uh, to keep us prepared for taking care of ourselves and our clients. Check your high school graduation book. I'll take a look. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome, Don. Right.